Today we are going to be exploring 38 essential student jobs for the classroom of tomorrow. <laughs> air horns for the classroom of tomorrow. Uh, this is truly one of my favorite things to talk about, uh, if not my favorite thing to talk about when it comes to education. This was one of the first things that I started creating conference sessions about and wanting to talk to other teachers about and putting resources online. Love talking about classroom jobs. Um, and so I'm excited that you are here. Uh, if you're if you're in the chat watching live, I'd love to hear where you are tuning in from. So you can just say, hey, I teach this or I support ed educators in this way and I'm 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 tuning in from Austin, Texas or something like that. But I am uh Tom Gibson. I am the chief marketing officer of and co-founder of New Ed Tech Classroom. Uh and if we are first meeting, uh you probably don't know that <laughs> I recently had a new child uh which has been uh fun. <laughs> we already have a two and a half year old little girl. Uh, now we have a little uh, like one and a half month old little boy. Hey, Reyna, welcome. It's good to see you here. Um, but it's uh, it's been interesting. You know, you, everyone always says like, oh, the, the, the second one is always a, a little bit different. Uh, all your kids are, are completely different. They're their own people. Um, and so I've definitely seen that. I think we were pretty spoiled um, with our first one. She was not a, a big crier at all. <laughs> so uh, our new our new son is a little bit more of a crier. But uh, my daily routine these days, I get up pretty early with him uh, and just kind of hold him uh, after after my wife feeds him. And um, I'll read read my Bible and read a devotional and uh, do some just catching up on email uh, on my iPad while I'm holding him. And then he'll come into my office just out of out of out of shot over. Here, there's a little bassinet that he can sit in, uh, and I work, and and then I go downstairs when everyone starts waking up because I get up earlier than everybody else, um, and then spend some time with the family. And then my my two and a half year old girl goes to a Montessori school. She doesn't go that day. Uh, we are usually uh, going out for a run, uh, and it's been. It's been good. Like uh, the, the I, I then got, kind of work in the afternoon and make dinner, uh, but that's kind of been my routine lately, and just kind of getting used to taking care of uh, another 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 little kiddo. But I don't like that word kiddo. I don't know why I just said that. But <laughs> Raina, hi from South Texas. Uh, hello from Central Texas here in Austin, Texas. But um, the interesting thing about when it, you you start having kids is like it really kind of helps you really think about how you spend your time. Um, and a while ago, I read this book called The 4-Hour Work Week. Um, I am working more than four hours, but one of the main principles of The 4-Hour Work Week was if you want to free up time for what you're doing, uh, you got to do three things. You got to, you have to think about what are the things that you can eliminate. Um, and for me, I was like, what are the things I just got to stop doing? And that for me, that's like kind of keeping the office like super tidy and clean. If I cut to this shot right here, you can see it's, it's, you can't tell it's kind of a mess, but they're like the closet over there has got all sorts of stuff all over. I usually, my desk has got more stuff on than I like it, but I'm like, well, I'm in just a di different season of life. And so I can't just keep everything like super tidy. So what can you eliminate? Uh, and then you have to think through what can you automate uh, if you're trying to free up time. Um, and for me, that's like, all right, I am making sure that all of my bills are on auto pay because I don't have time to go in and pay individual bills. What, what, what can I automate in my life so it's one less thing for me to worry about? Um, and then what is the thing that I can delegate? Uh, and shortly before we had our second child, um, I decided, you know what, I'm going to pay the $35 every two weeks for someone to come mow my lawn because <laughs> that is an hour and a half that I don't have to spend doing it every two or three weeks. Uh, and they get it done like tw 20 minutes or something like that. And they do a way better job than me. So eliminate, automate, and delegate. And as teachers, we need to think about what can we eliminate, automate, and particularly with class jobs, what can we delegate? You see what I did there with that transition? So I want to hear from you in the chat. As you are, as the educators here, we got uh, Lena Braun coming in from South Dakota teaching middle school math. Welcome, Lena. Uh, I want to hear from all of you. What are your tasks that you do as a teacher? Don't think about what can you eliminate? What can you delegate? What can you automate? Just what are your tasks? Okay. I want you to put in the chat, just type in one of your teacher tasks. It could be a really simple task. Like I open the blinds when I get to the classroom or it could be a really complex tasks. Like I design my semester curriculum. I want you to type that in the chat and then hit enter. And then I want you to think of another task and then type it in the chat and hit enter. And then I want you to think of another task. I want you to think of, of up to five different tasks 
and then hit enter. You make each one a separate little entry in in the chat right now because I'm actually going to be using that uh, using that list of just all the things that that teachers do, the tasks that they do uh, a little bit later as I as I as I begin to explore some of these classroom jobs and so. Go ahead and type them in the chat, uh, and then hit enter, and we'll we'll take a look in a little bit. Uh, but today we are exploring 28 essential student jobs for the classroom of tomorrow. And this is not just for elementary school. Let me say that again. This is not just for elementary school teachers. As students get older they are able and they are deserving and they should be getting more responsibility in the classroom we should not regulate classroom responsibility to middle school uh, to elementary school students we should be giving more responsibility to our middle school students to our high school students giving them more ownership of the classroom we should they are more capable of more sophisticated tasks as well in middle school and high school so why are we not tapping into that as educators and not delegating some of those tasks to the students to give them to give them more ownership of the class. But I am not just talking about uh, your typical classroom jobs that you may think about. You probably, as a middle school and high school teacher, you're thinking, I don't need a line leader. I don't need a pencil sharpener. I'm not talking about that. We're going to be talking about things like a class podcaster. We're going to be talking about, <laughs> yeah, a podcaster. We're going to be talking about a class barista, a class yogi. These are 21st century teacher or classroom jobs. And so these jobs are going to be doing three things for you. They're going to be able to take responsibility is off of your plate and put it and delegate them to the students. The second thing they're going to do is they're going to be able to amplify your student agency in the classroom because you're going to be empowering them with meaningful roles, not arbitrary roles, like meaningful things that you would normally be doing as a teacher um, and, and letting them take responsibility of that. And the third thing that giving your students classroom jobs is, is you are allowing them to learn 21st century skills uh, from skills that all of your students will learn if you do this in your class, like applying for a job. And I'll share a little bit of that process um, as well as like, depending on what job they get, if they become the class podcaster, they're going to learn a lot about like how to make a podcast, which is quite a 21st century classroom skill or how to make a video screencast. And there's several jobs that would be doing that. So I'm going to be sharing a bunch of different ideas, um, but I also want you as an educator to start thinking through what are some of the things that you do as a teacher um, that maybe could be delegated. Uh, Raina, a little bit earlier, wrote that um, providing needed resources to teachers. And so, Raina, I'm not sure what your role is and if you, you work uh, directly with students or if you work in primarily with teachers, uh, but if you had the opportunity to work with students, like thinking through like, okay, this is one thing that I normally do. Is there some capacity for me to kind of turn this into a classroom job? Uh, because I think as, as teachers, we, we think of the very simple things that we can turn into jobs like, oh, straighten out the desks or <coughs> open the blinds or things like that. But sometimes there's more complex things that maybe we could be doing and allowing students to do and not just doing ourselves. Um, so maybe you write a newsletter every week to the families. And you're like, there's no way a student could do that. Maybe there is. Maybe you you want to you want to post pictures of of the classroom and of student work uh, to your classroom private website. And you're like, well, I got to take care of that because it's gonna be too much of a distraction and kids can't do it. Maybe they can, you know. So they may not be able to take over all of your teacher responsibilities. But before you say like, I don't think a student could do this. Try to consider in what is there some capacity that this task that you do as a teacher could be done by a student. So think through that. I'm going to be giving you a bunch of answers, but I want a bunch of job ideas, but I wanted to give you that caveat of like, like really think through what could be done. Um, that is normally something a teacher would do. And like the more of a real job that the student sees that it is like, oh, the teacher would normally be doing this, but I'm doing that. The more, the more authentic it is, because I remember in elementary school, when I taught elementary school, a lot of teachers had like the line leader in the caboose. The caboose was like the last person in line. And like, that was their job to be the last person in line. Like that's 
that's not a meaningful job. And maybe in first and second grade, they're like excited about that. But after, when they get a little bit older, they're like, I don't really know what the purpose of this job is. And so if they see that these jobs are things that you as a teacher would be doing instead, there's more authenticity in the job and there's a little bit more buy-in and a little bit more ownership. And so Lena also shared um, a few ideas like cleaning the desks, turning on the fun lights, getting a calendar and days left of school begins uh, beginning of the, uh, the beginning of the day. Yeah, like updating a class calendar. Could a student do that? Is there a way that they could have access to like a shared Google Drive or Google Sheet um, or shared Google Calendar and then they have access to the calendar of what needs to be updated? So think through <coughs> what are your tasks that could be done by a student? Um, but every task that I'm going to uh, share today, um, I have... Uh, a list of 28. I'm not going to have time to get through all 28 today, but if you would like to get all 28 uh, classroom job ideas, um, if you go to newedtechclassroom.com slash class jobs, it's one of the top links down in the description. Uh, you can get this Google Doc emailed to you. You can see I've got the title of the job. I've got the job description. I've got the qualifications of the job. I, I have how often this job is completed because not every job is done every day. Um, and then uh, depending on what your context is, maybe you, you, you have a hybrid classroom or a remote classroom or you're in person. I did make a note on whether this is like something that could be done versus remote or in person or both or neat or, or one or the other. And so if you want to get this email to you, go to newedtechclassroom.com slash class jobs. And I will also, after I send that to you, I'll also email, email you some other resources like my class job application and like the checklist that I give students to complete their classroom jobs. Um, so if you'd like that, check it out. Uh, but I want to uh, go and start diving into um, these, these different jobs. So um, if you are watching here live before, as I get into these, if you have questions about these class jobs, go ahead and put them down in the chat. Um, and then once I go through all of them, I will answer some of the questions that, that people have about these jobs. So the class podcaster, uh, in my class, the class podcaster would create, uh, one podcast a day, a month, not one podcast a day. That would be an extraordinary amount of podcasts, uh, one podcast a month, and they would only do it, uh, about three minutes later long. Um, I didn't want it to be something that was overwhelming. Uh, they didn't typically use class time for this. I would help. I would meet with them uh, in office hours to plan the podcast. Um, we did a lot more planning together in the first few months of doing this. Um, and I gave them resources on how to make a podcast. Like if they've made a podcast before, if they've never done audio stuff before, it's like, okay, well, what kind of computer do you have access to? Do you have a Mac? Do you have a PC? Have you ever used, uh, I, I, have you ever used a uh, garage band? Have you ever heard of something called Soundtrap? Uh, and then I would ask them, what kind of, what do you want to do a podcast? about if we're in a math class let's have a few math things what are there fun things that you would want to do and um, I remember that I expected all of the very talkative students to be the ones to apply for this job and I was I was pleasantly surprised that um, one year one of my most reserved students applied for the podcaster job I was like well that's interesting um, and so I'll, I'll call him M and I was like, all right, Emma, well, I'm going to go and give you the job. And have you ever done anything like this? He's like, yeah, I've played with GarageBand before. I was like, great. Well, here's a tutorial on how to make a podcast in GarageBand so you can kind of just play around with it. When do you think you could have this podcast ready if you want? If we want a three-minute podcast? Um, and he was like, uh, maybe in two weeks. I was like, great. And then I, instead of like him just writing it in his agenda and forgetting about it, one of the things that I would do to remind the both of us is I would I would draft up an email in, in, in Gmail and you can schedule an email to be sent. And so I'm like, all right, I want you to I want you to see. I'm gonna send an email to the both of us that that shows up in our in our inbox two days before it's due. Just checking in on how it is, so that way I don't have to remember it. And he he knows he's gonna get that email uh, just for some accountability and to automate some of that. Uh, and then two weeks came by, and a day before he sent me the podcast, and it had music that he wrote. It had several different segments, including a um, math joke of the month. Month. He had a title for the podcast, and I, I not only he did not only just send me the podcast, but I put it on an app called SoundCloud. Um, so that way, if I shared it with someone, it would be like I made this podcast art, but that could have been something he did. It would be something that like this nice visual graphic. I think it looks nicer than just having an audio file in Google Drive. And this is important. Like 
this podcast did not just turn into something that he shared with me. And I'm like, that's great. Thanks for doing this. I emailed this podcast, it was a pre-algebra student, to all three of my pre-algebra classes and included their parents. And I said, hey, M had just completed this podcast, um, and here's what this this month this month's episode includes. Go take a listen, um, and if you see him, tell him he did a great job. And I want to play the first few seconds of this podcast for you. This is music that he composed in GarageBand. This is the monthly sum. My name is Makai, and I'll be your host for today's episode. So first, we have Zane with the Mathematician of the Month. Hey, this is Zane. Today we're going to be talking. So I think that that audio might have been doubling for a little bit. Sorry about that. But that one, we actually had a couple podcasters in that class and they collaborated. Um, and there's a couple different options for what you can do. You can use uh, Wii Video. It's a, use typically a, a video editing platform, but you can also use audio. You can use GarageBand. And I don't have, and there's like a, just an easy tutorial on how to, you know, how to make a podcast in GarageBand. Um, and I don't have a link right here, but Soundtrap, I can just actually just show you right here, Soundtrap.com. Um, it's like a Google Doc, but for audio. So literally multiple people can be in here editing at the same time. Um, and so adding different parts. And so they don't even have to be in the same place in order to make a podcast collaboratively. Soundtrap mostly has um, uh, a lot of edu- a lot of music stuff, uh, but it could be done for podcasting. There's a whole education section. And what's nice is you can actually delete the text down here. And if you delete the text, it actually deletes the audio. So it's actually a really cool program just to know how to use in general. So that is the class podcaster. Let me know in the in the, in the chat or in the comments if you're watching the the play the replay. Uh, what questions do you have about the class podcaster? The second job is the athletic trainer. Uh, the athletic trainer is the person that really needs to get up and move. Um, and so they are in charge of making sure all of us get up and move. Every day, I had the athletic trainer set a timer to go off right in the middle of class. And then they would actually say, like, oh, Tom, the timer went off. And then they would say, everyone, stand up. And they would lead the class in movement and in exercise uh, for, for two to three minutes. Like, all right, everybody put your your hands up everybody touch your toes everybody run in place and some of these students were like they they took this job seriously they're like ashley you're not moving please raise your hands up please do the participate please participate in the athletic training movement thank you and it was so funny and so awesome like how much ownership they took over these jobs and it just made sure that there was movement happening and then if you have your students that need that movement they will not forget to set that timer because you will i always did because I was always moving around and I wasn't tired, but if they're just if they're not getting as much movement, uh, they need that. So athletic trainer. Uh, the next job is the class of DJ. <laughs> The class DJ uh, picks some music to play as students are walking into the classroom. So, of course, this has to be appropriate music. And so have a conversation with your students about what is appropriate music. Uh, but they they are allowed to, to, to I, I encourage them to have a variety of songs. And then they typically will share something about that song. And so maybe it's, you know, some uh, some song from, you know, some band that, you know, that that is that is. It's like a, a European band that nobody in the class has heard of or an African band or a New Zealand band or a Spanish band or something like that, you know, just showing a diverse flavor of music. Um, and it really just sets a tone to kind of just have some fun when you're coming into the classroom. And so uh, one way you could do this is to maybe have the students set up a Spotify playlist. And if they think anything's going to be inappropriate, just run it by you. And I'm like, if you think it might be inappropriate, maybe skip that one. So that way you can you can avoid you know, <laughs> some songs. You're like, that was probably not a good thing to play in the classroom. So that is the class DJ, the board's manager. Uh, the board's manager would actually write uh, the agenda on the board for me every day. And so I would uh, share a, a Google sheet with them. So as long as I kept that updated, um, they would be able to access like what the agenda for the day was, the objectives, and what, what students need to have out on their desks. And then um, I created a an example of what it should look like. So I want the date and the, the class real big and bold in one color, and then the objectives with bullet points in another color, and then have out in another color. Um, and one 
key point about training students is like whenever they did it, it, the first time they did this, a lot of times like it wasn't great or they wrote too small or they forgot to color code. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Let's not forget to color code. Let's erase it and do it again. Um, I would really encourage you to make them do it again, not in a punitive way, but just like, oh, let's 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 do this right. Um, because if if you let it slide the first few times, you're gonna be kind of like fighting them for the rest of the year of like, oh, now remember you're supposed to do this. But if they see like, oh, he made me erase it, I got to do it all over again, they will, they, it'll be more likely that they will follow through and do it correctly the next few times. So boards manager, super helpful. Um, and they should have neat handwriting as well. Uh, the motivational speaker, the motivational speaker would record a short video about one minute long every week about a quote, an idea, a thought that they wanted to share with the students. And a lot of times it was just maybe a talking head video like this. And they're like, Hey everyone, a uh, motivational speaker here, um, Tom here. And I just want to share this quote with you. And then they would pull up a quote right here. And like, I love this quote because it really inspires me to, even when things are getting difficult, when things are getting hard, like to really just try my best best and to keep persevering because I know uh, that through difficult things, I will learn and learn from the struggle and learn from my mistakes. So anyways, stay motivated. And what's funny about that is like one student was doing this and he would actually start, uh, he didn't realize it, but he was kind of like creating his own style and brand and he was ending the videos the same way. He was like, all right, well, happy motivational Monday and stay motivated. And then if he didn't say that, people were like, oh, he didn't say it. And it's like, he doesn't realize like that is branding, you know, like the things that people get to know like you, the, your reputation and the way you get to become known and how you do things is your brand and so any learn screencasting skills this could be uh, something that is done with screencastify or loom um, you could also use flipgrid uh, if you want just one place where they're putting their videos each time and flipgrid's got all some fun sorts of filters and things like that uh, but this is great for your students that are that love the spotlight love to talk um, give them a, a little outlet for this I'm sending an email out to tomorrow about specifically about a teacher who implemented this for the the student that was the class clown and she talked about how 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 much ownership he took of that job and how seriously he took it. Um, and it really turned like that, that inclination to kind of just be up in front of people and presenting and speaking and kind of being funny and making jokes and turn it into a really positive thing for the classroom. So a reminder, as I am going through this, feel free to leave your questions in the chat. If you're like, well, how does this work? Or how does that work? Or how do you do this? Um, I, I will answer them once I get through uh, these jobs right here. The barista. I got some music, that kind of barista music. Yeah, that's kind of like, well, that's more like elevator music. But yeah, it's kind of like a barista. <laughs> I think the music was coming through. So what's so what's great about this is you can have a student make your coffee for you. Now, it's likely maybe you've got a Keurig in the back of your room and I have a two and a half year old and she basically knows how to work the Keurig by this point. Like you put this thing in, you pull it down and then you, uh, you, 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 you push the button. I'm just laughing at one of the comments, uh, that says, Hey everyone, my name's Mickey Mouse. So you want to come to my clubhouse? <laughs> it's funny because my daughter loves Mickey Mouse clubhouse, but the barista, uh, will make your coffee for you. And I would even venture to say, if you have, you know, if, depending on the culture of your school, you could teach your your student to go to the teacher's lounge, pour you a cup of coffee, and then bring it to you. And then if anyone asks them any questions, just like, oh, I'm the class barista, and I'm getting Thomas coffee. <laughs> and I think it'd be a fun conversation starter. One teacher that implemented this, you can, she posted this on her Instagram and, and shared it with me. Um, but she actually got, you can see there's this little she got a little apron for the student and she taught them you can see her little caption this person is trained on how to make my french press coffee and my cold brew so if there have ever been 21st century skills to be learning it is <laughs> those skills right there so class barista is definitely will come in clutch uh, every day uh, the visual display artist. This is the uh, the job of the person who makes posters in the classroom. Now, most of the time, when you when you have posters in your classroom, uh, you may you may put posters up at the beginning of the year, and you're like, all right, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna put this poster up here, and I'm gonna put this poster right here, and this one's gonna remind the students of these grammar rules, and this one's gonna remind like the kids see the posters and they <laughs> recognize them like the first week of school, and then it just blends into the background and they. They never see it again. 
Now contrast that with the 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 visual display artists where they are actually making one new poster a month. So it's not all the posters going up at once, but something new every month related to what we have been learning and it is student created. And so this wasn't a poster, but this was one of the things that I needed at the beginning of the year and I had one of my visual display artists uh, in years past I literally just took a Sharpie to like a white piece of paper and said Tom's office hours Tuesday and Thursday during lunch, you know, and just like put it on the wall. I'm like, can you make something nice for this? And look how much time she took to make this like look really nice and professional and and worthy of presentation you know like again like she's not just making this for uh, she, this wasn't for a grade she wasn't just making this so like just to get it done she knew that this would be on display and serve a purpose and that is the biggest thing um with a lot of these jobs is like actually having a purpose to them and so and then you can celebrate like, oh, we've got a new poster from our visual display artist or one class will be like, oh, did the visual display artist in the other class make that? That's awesome, you know? So it's like a really cool way to celebrate students' artistic abilities. This could also be a graphic designer job. If you have graphics that you want made on your learning management system, if you want, you know, nice headings and headers for your, your Google Classroom classes or something like that, but you don't really have the time or the energy to make them in Canva because it's not like a number one priority, like you're gonna have a student that's gonna wanna, would love to do that for you. Um, even if they typically have never used things like Canva, like there's so many tutorials um, for that. And so this could be physical posters that go up in the class. Um, and this could be this could be actual digital digital things as well. So the attendance monitor, this one was super helpful because I always forgot attendance. Like I would uh, have my computer out and the first thing that the attendance monitor would do, um, they, there was a bookmark for attendance and they would go to my computer and I could still see my computer and I could see what they were doing and everything like that. So they never had like my computer in the corner by themselves. They would go to the computer they would open up that tab. They would look to see after the bell rang who was here and who was tardy. They would mark everything, they would save it and then they would go sit down. So that that saved me a ton of time. And again, like they didn't have access to like my grade book or anything like that. And I saw everything that when it was happening, uh, some teachers are like, well, you give them access to your attendance. Like you don't even have to give them access to your attendance. You could give them access to a spreadsheet. And then you look at the spreadsheet after class and take attendance. If you just generally forget all the time, like I did, um, which, so I've done it both ways. Uh, the tutorial creator. This is your student that is the aspiring YouTuber, the one that loves to make videos. Um, and this is almost like in conjunction with having almost like a class tutor, having somebody that that can make tutorials on the subject matter. And maybe they're not like, you know, obviously they're not going to be tutorials and stuff they haven't learned yet. But if they have kind of got a grasp on a subject, you're like, hey, can you make a tutorial on this new math concept that we use? I'd like to add it to our our class website as a resource to your classmates. And I did this uh, with my robotics class. Um, and you can actually see this little section of this robotics video. This is not the whole thing, but you can see what he did. So it should go forwards, sense the wall, and turn and go forwards. So let's see if that works. So he was filming not only his screen and showing the actual code and how to build it, but he showed like he actually then filmed on his phone and then showed the robot. So he had to learn how to do it. And then he had to put those things together and he had to make sure that the audio sounded good and that everything was 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 clear and easy to read and see and, and helpful. And I was like, this is great. And this was a student that loved YouTube and he also loved robotics. So it was like a, he was literally the perfect fit for the job. You can use things like like Loom, you can use things like Screencastify, you can use things like Flipgrid. Those are all Wii Video. Those are all apps that you can make screencasts pretty easily. Or if they like want to do things in iMovie, um, or if they're learning Premiere Pro and they really want to level up, maybe you're working with high schoolers that are in film class and they know those more advanced, uh, those more advanced platforms. But it could be as simple as just like a simple screencast. Um, but maybe you're doing a math class. And you, you're like, well, how is a student going to show math work? Well, that actually is where our sponsor comes in, uh, Wacom. Wacom has a um, uh, write these pen tablets. I've got one right here. This is what I always made my tutorials for with, for students. I would throw one of these in my backpack, um, and I would just be able to – this one was Bluetooth. This one's the Intuos. I'll show you some of the other ones they have on their website. I would actually just put, have this in my backpack, and so my free period, I would record a video, and if it was like stuff 
stuff that I had to show for math. This was connected via Bluetooth. And as I wrote on this tablet, uh, the digital whiteboard that I had on my computer screen, it would show the writing up on the computer screen as well. And so this could be something for you as a teacher or for a tutorial creator that you have. Um, the, the, the one that is the most budget friendly that I think you probably, if you want to, if you were going to get one for the classroom for a student to use is the one by Wacom. It's about $50. Um, it's Chromebook compatible and you can kind of see it comes in two different sizes. The smaller one is the $50 one. Uh, but as you see, you write it on there. This one, uh, this one is not wireless. It's not Bluetooth connected. It's connected to be a USB, um, but it allows you to actually write digitally to have digital ink. So to say, or so to speak, um, um, the other one is, uh, this one would be one that would I would not give to the student unless you, your school was buying a few of them because this one's more expensive. This one's about $400, uh, but you can get 20% off with the, the coupon code Wacom New Ed Tech. Uh, this is like if you've ever used a Wacom tablet, but it's been a little bit awkward for you. This one's different because the actual computer screen is on the, uh, let's play this real quick and mute it. The actual computer screen is on the tablet. And so at, you actually see what you are writing on. So it connects via HDMI and Bluetooth. And so like some people have a hard time writing on the tablet because they're like, well, it's weird. I'm looking at the tablet, but then I have to watch the screen. This brings the screen to the tablet um, and it is connected to your, your computer. Um, so that is like, if you've ever been like, yeah, so you can kind of see it down here. You see like the little airplane right there. So these are really, really fun uh, to write on. Um, and so that one's the most natural writing experience. And my favorite one, one is the Wacom Intuos. Um, I've worked with both the small and the medium one. I use the medium on my larger monitor. Um, and so the small, you can get a wired or you can get a Bluetooth one or you can get the medium one, which is already Bluetooth. Uh, and if you've got a, if you're working on a laptop, small, I think is plenty, is plenty big enough. If you're working on a big 27 inch monitor, you may want a medium. And so the, if you want to get 20% uh, off of any of the ones that I mentioned right there, uh, you can use the coupon code Wacom New Ed Tech when you you, uh, check out. So thank you so much for, for sponsoring this live stream. Welcome. Uh, and just being such supporters of, of what we're doing here at New Tech Classroom. The next classroom job is the zoologist. And this is not necessarily like if you have a class pet, like a lot of elementary schools will have like a class rabbit or something like that. Uh, the zoologist is actually the person... <laughs> Is, is the person who takes care of our class mascot. And you may be thinking well, like, well, who is the mascot? It is the pet of whoever the zoologist is. So you're gonna have that student that has like seven pets at home <laughs> and will be like, I want my crested gecko to be our class pet. And every week they bring in a photo or video of our class mascot, our class pet, and then they tell us how they have been doing and they continue to care and love for the class mascot as the zoologist. I had kids foaming at the mouth at this job when I first introduced it because they love loved animals and they're just like I need this job Tom. so zoologist is going to be for your uh it's super it's just a fun culture building thing in your classroom uh, the next job is the assistant grader. Uh, there's a few ways that you can you can go about doing this. Um, first, I will say the assistant grader never has access to my official grade book. Never give access to your official grade book to any students. But that doesn't stop students from still being able to assist you in some capacity. So a couple of things that I've had my assistant grader do. I used to use Khan Academy as a as a way to for students to do homework. And a lot of it, most of it was almost a like kind of like a completion grade. And it was kind of cumbersome to go into Khan Academy, find that class, find that assignment, see who did it, and then you know take those grades and put them in my official grade book. So what I had my assistant grader do was I gave them my Khan Academy login because that wasn't connected to my official grade book, and I didn't I didn't care about them going into my I didn't think they were going to do anything wrong in my Khan Academy account. And then they would take a screenshot of every class and then send me the screenshot of that class's assignments, and then I could easily I could put the grades in just so much faster. Um, and one year I even had a student that um, would send a blind carbon copy 
to all of the students that had the missing assignment and said they had two days to complete it. And once they completed it, just to email Tom to let him know that it is done. So not only were they taking care of getting those grades to me a little bit more efficiently and faster, they were also taking care of communication to students who were missing that assignment. Um, I've also had students that uh, they would go through and they would just highlight the first place a student made a mistake on a quiz or a test. And they always did this on, on a different, they didn't do their own classes. They maybe did a different pre-algebra classes. Or if they're in pre-algebra, maybe the seventh grade math class student did it for the sixth grade math class. Um, so they weren't ever grading their own paper. But they would they would have the answer key. And of course, they wouldn't see the answer key if it was a test that they were going to take before they were taking it. They would have the answer key and then they would highlight the first place that they noticed a discrepancy in some of the work. Or if it was just a multiple choice question, they would highlight that one. The student did not calculate any points on this. All they did was highlight the mistake or the first place they saw a mistake on a particular problem. Then I would go through and I would scan it and actually see which problems were highlighted and decide how many points to take off and then add the grade and put it in my grade book. So the assistant grader never actually knew what students were getting. And so there, some people are worried about FERPA. Um, they're like, it doesn't this go against FERPA. Uh, there was a course case, a court case. I cannot remember the name of it, um, but it, it basically said as long as you know, like the old practice of like, if you let students grade one another's, you know, great papers and then give it back to the teacher, that's not like a violation of FERPA. Um, as long as like, it's not an entire grade book, it's not being shared with students. So next time I do this or next time I share, I, I want to make sure I get that, that court case, um, the name of that, if you want to look into that, just cause you're like, eh. and you don't have to do this job either. If you feel kind of like, eh, I don't know about that. You don't have to, this just give you, gives you a few different ideas. All right, the tech guru. Now, if 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 I was in in my class, I would be the tech guru because if you look right here with like the microphone, I have two different types of mics for different contexts. I got a soundboard, all sorts of stuff. So the tech guru is going to be the job for your student that just loves technology. Uh, one of the things that I did with my tech guru was I had them actually when I was transitioning between classes and like I would have to come in the class. Like I I had one class and one one classroom and another I taught another class in another classroom and make the transition it was kind of frustrating um, to to have to go to the next class and then get my laptop out and then plug it in the projector and then pull up the class website and then try to go and say hi to the kids as they're coming into the classroom. So the tech guru was the person that would actually, I just, all I had to do was set my backpack down. They knew where my laptop was. They took the laptop out and they just said, hey, Tom, can you put your password in? And I was like, tick, 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 tick. and then they went to, they went to go put my, uh, the laptop over um, over where it needed to go on the projector. Uh, and then they plugged it in and then they pulled up the class website. Uh, and then they, they, they went and sat down. And so they basically took care of all of that. And then if there was any tech stuff that we were doing as a class, um, if students needed help, my tech guru was the person to go around and help them, uh, with their Mac, or with their PC, or we'll tell them which website to go to or anything like that. Um, tech guru always helped out, um, the class and me with any technical, uh, assistance. The next job is the KonMari organizing specialist. And so if you have ever seen uh, tidying up or heard of Ms. KonMari, she's like the person that is uh, all about like keeping spaces clutter-free, um, getting rid of things that don't don't spark joy in you. So basically like keeping things organized. And you're gonna have your students that, that love to have their pencils all in a straight row and color-coded and everything is always in its right place. They will love to make sure that all of your supplies and your bookshelves and everything like that are organized. And I would say if you are training students for this job to, to have maybe photos of what a space should look like to give them a reference point, and you can maybe even ask them like, hey, do you think that we could organize this a little bit better? Empower them, give them agency in this job, give them autonomy in this job. How much do we as educators want autonomy in what we're doing? Like, why not give the students autonomy and show like, hey, I, you have good ideas, you've got a skill set in this, I wanna hear what you have to say. So this is going to be for your, your organizing, organized students. The, the class yogi, 
This is the person uh, that just leads in a moment of mindfulness at the beginning of class. Uh, we all, all the classes did this at my old school, and so it was pretty normed that you would begin class with just a short moment of mindfulness. Uh, and mindfulness doesn't, if, if, if you hear mindfulness and you're like, oh, that's kind of weird, it, it, it doesn't have to be a weird thing. It's not like you're doing yoga and like going, oh, um, mindfulness most of the time in my class was just like, all right, everyone just sit up in your chair. If you've got anything in your hands, set it down, pull your shoulders back. Close your eyes if you want to, or if you just want to look down at your desk, you can. And let's just take three deep breaths in together uh, and pay attention to, 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 to what, the, what it feels like to bring in air, hold it, and let it out. So let's take a deep breath in. And let it out. And then we would do that a few more times, and then I would say, Thank you. Uh, and, it, and it serves as just like a good, just mental reset. Uh, they say mindfulness is like the practice of focus, um, giving you an opportunity to be like, let me just let me just focus on my breath. And my mind's going to wander to other things. But when I notice that it kind of like I start thinking about like what I need to do later in my sports team and things like that, let me just just bring my focus back to my breathing and what it feels like. So that is that is all mindfulness can look needs to look like it doesn't and like you can even use an app called Headspace. Uh, if your student wants to do this, but doesn't really know how um, those apps have like some guided ones that are only a couple minutes long to and then the student could basically just model that uh, and do similar something similar to what I just did. Um, whenever it is their job to, to do this. And so we just did this at the beginning of every class period, really helped start the class on the right note. The next job is the teacher's assistant. I would say that this was probably the most important job. Um, this was like my very type A students, like my Cone Marie organizing specialist could probably also be really good teacher assistants. Uh, like they're very organized. They, they they got this big checklist that I'm gonna show you in a little bit of like who does what job when, because I don't wanna have to keep track of all of these jobs and who needs to do what, because like the whole point of this job, the, these jobs is to free up my own time and mental space so that I can focus on like teaching and working in small groups and helping students individually, not like, wait, who did this job? Did you do that job? Did you, who's, who's got to do, who's this supposed to be doing, you know, like that, that ends up becoming just really stressful. Uh, so I, I make that a student job. Uh, and the teacher assistant has a list to say like, okay, at the beginning of class on Monday, this person does this job. At the end of class on Tuesday, that person does this job. And this person, can you check in about the zoologist? How is a crusty or crested gecko doing? Um, and so they, they are, they are one of the, the, the key the players in making sure all of this works out well. So as far as hiring students, again, if you've got any questions, please let me know in the chat. If you're like, what aspect of this, if there's any aspect of this that just doesn't make sense to you or you're just not really sure how this would look in your context, let me know in the chat and I'll answer the questions after I go through um, these, these, uh, these segments. So I have a job application that I have students do because I want them to have more ownership of the job. I want to have more buy-in in the job. If I assign jobs, there is a great chance that I'm gonna assign a job to a student who does not wanna do a job and you are fighting an uphill battle in that regard if they don't want to do that specific job. So you introduce all the jobs to your students at the beginning of the year or give them a document that has all of them, tell them to read through it, and then tell them, give me your top three choices. And like this is part of what a Google form looks like that I use. Um, and they say what their top choice is and they say why they'd be a good fit for the job. Um, include any neat ideas you have for the job. And we have a conversation on you know how to answer that second question, like saying, I really want the job because like, I think it's cool. Like That doesn't convince me as your employee. Employer. Like, what are the things that you can do? What are you? Gonna, what ideas are you going to bring to this that's going to benefit me as your as your as your boss here, or as your you know as your lead, as your guide, and really what's uh, something that's going to benefit the class um, and. Like I had a job that was called Minecraft Mentor because I wanted to do more stuff with Minecraft in the classroom, but I was not an expert and I knew I had some experts in there. And they were like, I am so, I love teaching people how to play Minecraft and things you can do in it. I've actually used Minecraft in some of my other classes for those projects. And so I really think I could bring a lot to this role. And so they're telling me and they're convincing me why they should have the job, not just saying like, oh, please, I really would love this job. And so then I get a Google Sheet and kind of try to sort it. I really, really work to give students one of their top three jobs. If I have to give it, like if I, if there's a job that I need in the class and nobody applied for it, I may ask a student like, hey, I know you didn't apply for this job. I think you'd be a good fit for this job because of X, Y, and Z. Would you be willing to do this? 
I would say about seven out of 10 times they say, oh yeah, sure, no problem. Because also it's someone, an adult in their life saying like, I see something in you that I think you'd be good at this. And a lot of students, and when they're younger, like especially like our elementary, middle school, they've never had that experience. You know, as adults saying, I, I see something in you and I think you could do this well. And so first, let me get a drink of water from my Audrey cup. Um, so this, that's what I do if they don't, if they, if I need to give them a job that they did not apply for. And then, um, yeah, it creates the buy-in. It builds anticipation because students are like, oh, I wonder what job am I going to get? And they're like, Tom, did you assign the jobs yet? I'm like, not yet. I'm trying to go through all these spreadsheets and try to give you your top jobs. And it teaches them how to add value. That, that second question about like, you know, don't just tell me you want the job because you want it. You know, tell me why it's going to benefit your classmates and me for you having the job. And then as far as training students, the, what I would say, um, <laughs> I read this book a few years ago, uh, Atul Gawande is a, uh, is a neurosurgeon and he's practiced neurosurgery all over the world. Uh, and, and he said the thing that it made practices better, whether you were talking about like the most prestigious hospitals in the world to, to very rural hospitals in third world countries. The one thing that made hospitals and neurosurgeons and nurses make fewer mistakes and errors was a checklist. So if neurosurgeons need a checklist, your middle schoolers and elementary schoolers and high schoolers are going to need checklists for some of their jobs. Granted, these aren't neurosurgery jobs, but some checklists are very simple. This is the checklist or the at least the bullet points for the athletic trainer. Um, it tells them you have to set a timer for 25 minutes uh, right at the start of class. And once the timer goes off, look for a good moment uh, that you know it's a time for a little bit of movement. Try not to interrupt. But if I just keep going for a while, feel free to interrupt. And then lead the class in one to two minutes of movement and stretches. Super simple. Whereas some jobs have a more elaborate checklist. This is just one day of the checklist for the teacher assistant. You can see like before we called our mindfulness moment centering. So before we centered, they needed to make sure that these five jobs were done. And then after we centered, they needed to make sure these four jobs were done. And then at the end of class, they needed to make sure these three jobs were done on Monday. And it had the student's name and it told them exactly what they needed to do. So all they had to do was go down the checklist. My super organized teacher assistant, um, I remember she she had printed this out and she even made her own version of it that was color coded. <laughs> I'm like, that's why you have this job. And it was it was great. So have checklists for your students. So again, if you want to get the list, I only went through like 15 jobs. If you want to get the full list of classroom jobs, uh, go to newedtechclassroom.com slash class jobs, and it's going to take you here. You'll get the full list of 28. It is a customizable Google Doc um, where you will be able to just del you know delete any of the jobs that you pl don't plan on incorporating or change the description or change the frequency. Customize it however you like, but it just gives you a great starting point uh, for, for, for beginning to do this. And this is the, the new semester semester is the perfect time to kind of begin to think about doing something like this. Some teachers, they feel like, oh, I really should feel wait for the start of the year. Like the second part of the year is the best time to experiment with something new. And you don't have to have a job for every student. You can, but if you're, I'm just going to get a few jobs and then have students apply if they want to do it and then see what happens and then actually, you know, go through that training process and, and go do that. But the second semester is such a great time or even like after spring break is such a perfect time to start experimenting with this because then you get to see like what's working, what's not. And then you'll, you'll, you'll be able to start the year much stronger with classroom jobs and having done it a little bit in the previous semester. So go to newedtechclassroom.com slash class jobs is also linked down in the description. If you would like to get that call to action. Um, and additionally, if you, before I get to the Q and a, if you are watching the replay, um, I will say click right here to watch this video on, are you a 21st century teacher? Uh, and it really ties in with the these 21st century classroom jobs uh, and some other skills of what it means to be a 21st century teacher. So we'll see you over there.